Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast, which delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. So welcome to the Naturally Nourished podcast, Sharon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we are stoked to have you here today as well. And for listeners who don't know your personal story, I'd love you to open with just giving a little bit about your background with nutrition and also the story within your household with you working with your son and really how you came to make bone broth as a passion, really kind of understanding the mechanisms of of, of why it's such a big piece of, of your life. Sure. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I just got back from a nutrition conference. I was gone for four days and I came back on such a high and it was so good to be around, uh, you know, moms and uh, men and women who have a passion for nutrition and really just how food affects the body. And, you know, unfortunately, when I was growing up, um, there wasn't a lot of information back then about how food affected your health. And, Really, I grew up in that generation of, you know, just um, uh, kind of really just ignorance. Ignorance was kind of bliss. And so my story really is that I have three children and we have a middle son who's 20 years old. And when he was six, about six months old, he was born perfectly fine. He was about six months old, um, about six and a half. He developed his first sinus infection. And so I took him to the pediatrician, which is what you did 20 years ago when your child had a sinus infection. And the pediatrician put him on his first round of antibiotics. And he pretty much stayed on a round of antibiotics on and off for the first six years of his life. Um, He progressively got worse. He um, He had sinus infections, ear infections, respiratory infections. He had skin issues. Um, and you know, we were having to do things like, uh, steroids, albuterol to get, you know, have breathing treatments for this child. And he was just chronically sick and the doctors would just really kind of haphazardly, um, they, they would just prescribe antibiotics to this little guy. And so by the time he was six years old, he had been on about 23 rounds of antibiotics And, you know, I, looking back, you know, of course I have all of this crazy mom guilt, but I know it's really hard for us to believe it, but we didn't have the information at our fingertips that we did, that we do now, you know, 20 years ago. And so you kind of just did what the doctors told you. And so I went to a back to school night when he was in first grade and the teacher pulled me aside and said, you know, your son Blake is a really nice young man. Um, very respectful. And, uh, but she said, I, you know, I'm seeing that he's exhibiting signs of ADD and you should get him on Ritalin because it's easier for the teachers. I've been doing this for 20 years. It's easier on the families and then the kids that are around him. And I drove home from that teacher's meeting that night, just in tears with my husband. And I thought, this is insane. This is, this whole system is screwed up. And we need to do something different. And I didn't know what we were going to do, but I knew it was going to be drastic. And this was about 13 years ago. So I pulled him out of school that night, decided I was going to homeschool him. I wasn't a homeschooling mom, nor did I have any grand (laughs) dreams of becoming a homeschooling mom. But I decided I was going to do that because I knew I needed to do something drastic. I just didn't know what. There wasn't Instagram, you know, 12 years ago. There wasn't a lot of information on the internet even 12 years ago. And so I, I landed myself at the library and I came across the teachings of Weston A. Price and this idea about healing through food and that he had studied cultures all over the world and that food really could affect your health and that you could heal through food. And so this was a new kind of concept to me. I mean, we were the healthy family, but when I say healthy, I say that in parentheses because I grew up in the generation of low fat everything. So skinless, boneless, 
chicken breast, broccoli sprayed with, I can't believe it's not butter spray, you know, that was considered healthy. And so everything that I was reading was completely different than everything that I was doing. I mean, the idea that I could feed my son butter, you know, I just, I I literally wanted to go crawl in bed and cry because I thought I've, I've ruined my my child. (laughs) Um, And was it Wise Traditions? Is that Sally Fallon's book that you found first or what was the resource? I'd be interested to hear. It was doctor. It was, no, it was Weston A. Price's. So it was Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, his book. Mm -hmm. And it's a weighty book. I mean, Ali, you know that book and it's for nutrition nerds like us, but um, you know, it's, it could also be a piece of sleeping material for some people, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I delved in and I thought I have nothing else to lose. So I called my husband and I said, Hey, we're going to start healing through food. And then I did find Sally Fallon's book and we started incorporating everything that we read into his diet. Um, and we just, I just started cooking everything from scratch and putting bone broth into everything that I cooked for him. So morning smoothies, sauteed vegetables, braised meats. And within a couple of weeks, we started to notice a difference. He had, you know, less of a runny nose. He, you know, his eye infections were kind of going away, his recurring eye infections. And then three months went by, six months went by, a year later, and we completely healed this little guy from food. He, in fact, has never been back to the doctor since, and he's 20 years old. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So then I became this crazy mom who (laughs) would go to the parks and play groups and everywhere I could be invited to talk and sit with moms and on the phone and helping moms, you know, walk the same journey that I had. And that prompted me. I just thought I need to help people. And I went back to school, got several certifications. I had a business degree that I wasn't using. Um, I became an NTA, became a GAPS practitioner and a clinical nutritionist. And I started a practice here in Del Mar. And within two years, I had a four month wait list to work with me. And really, it was less about me and more about the program, which was just all food based. And um, my biggest challenge was getting people to make their bone broth. Um, And so I approached my husband and and that's kind of where the story began. And um, it just caught on. It, people, just, you know, we made it just like you did at home. And we started making this little bone broth out of my office, um, selling it out of my office. And, you know, and now here we are, 7,000 stores nationwide. And in the natural channel, it sells, outsells pizza and chicken nuggets out of the frozen thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Huge win. That's so awesome. <laughs> I love every time I see in a, a new grocery stores that will have on, you know, I don't know what those are called, the signs that head up the aisles, you know, now mm-hmm. that it's starting to say bone broth. I'm like, yes, it's a win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gosh, Allie, it's like, it's, you know, it's, that I just jump up and down, especially when it's in the frozen set. As I say, that basically means bona fide provisions anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just from a mom's heart and from a nutritionist's heart, um, so exciting because this was never a plan. This was never the plan to start a CPG company. The plan was to get this, you know, liquid gold into as many hands as we could and um, and really coming back from that nutrition conference, it just refueled my passion for getting the word out about food and, and how it really can heal the body. I love it. And it's it's such an amazing and kind of heartwarming story. And um, I just love, you know, hearing kind of where your passion originated and, and what you've taken it to, you know, today. Um, but can you tell us more about how you went from making this broth in your own kitchen, and uh, I believe your husband's a, a chef. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Um, so, how you went from your own kitchen to having this majorly successful CPG company, and and kind of what that process was like, and and also what it's been like um, to maintain, you know, quality and um, sourcing of ingredients and all of that while also growing. Sure. Well, it's it's been a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything looks easier than it actually is. And I know that you can attest to that, right? Even building a practice looks so much easier than it is. Um, and so really, um, you know, I call my husband and I, uh, you know, the 30 year overnight success story. We have um, been together for 30 years and have really kind of been these serial entrepreneurs. Um, we started in a restaurant, we own several restaurants and 
you know, my husband then became a contractor and he was a chef at one point in his career. And really, again, this was just out of a need. And I approached my husband and said, hey, would you start making some bone broth in our house just for my clients in my office? I know that there's just a few of, you know, a few individuals that are too sick or just didn't want to make their own bone broth. And I knew that we can kind of move the dial so quickly with them if we can get this liquid gold into their system. And he said no at first, you know, <laughs> he was like, uh, when would you like me to do that in my spare time? Um, you know, but a little persuasive, uh, you know, a, a mom in me just went to him and kind of begged and happy wife is a happy life, you know, from his <laughs> perspective. <laughs> and so we did. And so we started in our house um, and we then started, then the kids complained because our house smelled like chicken. And so we started <laughs> making it um, out, you know, outside and he had kind of this makeshift um kitchen outside. And then we then started to rent space from somebody who uh, uh, did uh, tamales here at some of the local farmers markets. And then she eventually stopped doing that. And we just took over her, the spaces next door and we continued to grow and grow and grow. And my husband, he's kind of this kind of jack of all trades. So he's, he's a chef, but he also has a contracting license, which is this beautiful combination because he can build houses and then cook you a great meal afterwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so he would just, um, you know, do all of the construction and we just continue to build and, and we launched it online and we then, um, you know, that was very successful. And then we launched into the SOPAC region of Whole Foods and really just, it, you know, we really kind of didn't know what we were doing from a CPG perspective. I mean, literally we launched, I always tell this story that we launched into Whole Foods nationwide and we went back to our jobs. We didn't have any marketing uh, program. We didn't do anything behind the brand. He went back to his contracting job and I went back to my nutrition office and I would just come back to um, my email and look for the next order, <laughs> for, <laughs> <laughs> which is the craziest thing when you hear what CPG con uh, companies have to do to really kind of scale brands. Um, and so that just kind of continued to grow. And then we, you know, we got a, a formal marketing program in place and we got some funding behind us and then we continued to scale. And, you know, where we are today, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy getting your product into 7,000 stores nationwide that, you know, it's particularly in the frozen section. And when we launched this brand, we were told don't go into the frozen section because people wouldn't know where to shop for it. And I kept, I kept saying to the retailers, you're wrong because moms intuitively know that's where they're, they store their own bone broth. So that's where they should be shopping for their bone broth. And so, um, we kind of created this whole little category within the frozen set, which is, you know, quite exciting and quite interesting. Um, but not, not easy, but de you know, definitely a wonderful ride that, that we've had. And, you know, when you ask me like what our biggest challenges are today or what, you know, where we are today as a brand, I would think um, the biggest challenge is just really educating the population of what a real bone broth is and what a real bone broth isn't. And I think that that is not just the challenge for bone broth brands, but for so many different items that are out there. Right. Take kombucha, right? I mean, think about um, what we're doing to kombucha. That, you know, kombucha is now being made from a powder and sugar. There's no scoby mushroom involved. The enzymes aren't there. The probiotics aren't there. And we're touting it as this beneficial drink when it's not. Well, unfortunately, the same thing's happening with bone broth. You go down the grocery store aisle, you grab one of these boxes off the broth or off the, you grab the box off the shelf and you look at the first ingredient and the first ingredient is bone broth and the second ingredient is vegetable broth. And they do that because it's far less expensive to create a vegetable broth than it is to create a true bone broth. And what breaks my heart is that these families are using this product oftentimes for medicinal purposes. Um, and so, you know, those are the kind of things that we're facing now. And the challenge of a brand is just getting really the word out that, Hey, make your own bone broth. And if you can't find a company that's doing it as close to homemade as you can.
Yeah, I'm sure it's evolved from back in middle, early 2000s of what is bone broth? Why is it therapeutic? And now I think that there's at least in, in the natural foods world, a known acceptance of, you know, seeking bone broth, but now it's the variance of quality. And, you know, let, let's kind of talk to listeners a little bit about how you like to make your own bone broth. Let's talk kind of crock pot, stock pot, instant pot within a household. And then, you know, what to look for. You mentioned a couple of things as far as buying store-bought and, and really why yours is frozen. But let's first talk about kind of like how to make bone broth, because I think that's an important piece of the puzzle too. Sure. And we always tell people, make your own bone broth. And if you can't, we're going to do it just like you do at home. And in fact, it's, it, we had a post this morning from somebody who posted in our story that she was trying our bone broth for the first time because she couldn't find bones um, from her local farmer. He was out of them. Um, and that's really, you know, I always tell people it's really quite simple to do. Um, so basically, you know, when you take the bones of an animal, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but when you take the bones of an animal and you simmer them for long periods of time, the bones will actually start um, pulling all, all of the minerals, the nutrients, the collagen, the amino acids from the bones, the bones will start breaking down and all of those wonderful properties of, of the bones um, become part of that broth. So adding things like apple cider vinegar will actually act like a chelator and pull all of those elements out of the bones. Um, and then turn it into what we refer to as this liquid gold. The longer cooking times are important. We've done labs, you know, originally when I, you know, 12 years ago, I had no idea why I was going using the bone broth, but now we have the science, we have the labs, we understand why now. Um, but basically uh, you want the longer cooking time. And we have found, Allie, that the sweet spot is about 18 hours. Mm -hmm. And so when you cook them for a minimum of 18 hours, you're getting the most amount of protein, the collagen, the amino acids that really are the kind of the, uh, the, the purposes kind of behind the bone broth. And then, you know, it really depends on you and where you are on your healing journey. For me, when I first created the bone broth, particularly our chicken and our beef, which are the first two that I started with in my nutrition practice, I would add onions and garlic because of the sulfur properties. I'm a huge proponent of sulfur in the body and how important it is, particularly in working with autistic children. And so um, I did add those to the garlic and the onions. And really from my perspective, it was more for medicinal purposes and less about taste. Because I always felt like you can add whatever you wanted to your bone broth to make it flavorful and make it taste the way that you want. But I really just wanted a really clean foundation. And so that's that's really what you need for your bones. I mean, for your bone broth, you want to make sure that you source your bones because bones are where we carry all of, you know, all, many of the toxins that, um, it, that are in, uh, our body, in our body. Same thing with animals. So if you think about like heavy metals, we as individuals, we store heavy metals in our tissues, right? some in our blood, you know, until it finally gets into the tissues, and then in our bones. And so you really, really want to be careful about how you source your bones. So grass-fed, of course, are best. Organic really needs to be organic because you do not want the, those cows consuming products um, and, you know, even grass that um, ha are laden with pesticides. And then same thing for chicken. And with our chicken, we do add the feet because the feet creates a more gelatinous broth. Um, we go a few extra steps. We use a triple filtered water. We use um, sea salt matters, right? The kind of salt that you use. And really there's many different kinds and nutritionists love many different brands. I happen to like um, Selena brand Celtic sea salt because I muscle test and that's always 100% of the time, no matter who the person was, tested 100% accurate. Um, and then a little bit of garlic and onions and then that long simmer cooking time. Sounds a lot. Oh, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Becky. <laughs> I was going to say, it just sounds a lot like how we make it. Allie and I both make it at home. And I remember 
when I first started buying chicken feet at the farmer's market, they were like, oh, you can have all of them for like $5. <laughs> and now it's like, I go at 9am, you know, the market starts today and they're sold out. It's kind of amazing. Totally. And that same thing. Uh, I can't remember the name of the rancher, Becky, but in the Houston farmer's market, I was buying his beef knuckles and he was like, oh, well, we usually just roast some for dog treats. This was back yep. in like 2010. <laughs> And then in 2013, he said, I can't tell you, we were almost going out of business and you created an entire marketplace for me as a rancher because all of the stuff we were discarding started to become a product. And it's really cool to be a piece of that, you know, vote with your dollar and making more of a known impact on the snout to tail philosophy, both Becky and I being recovering vegans, <laughs> you know, it's a pretty <laughs> radical shift to, to go. And then that was kind of my making peace with consuming an animal and being an omnivore was then I'm going to honor the animal and eat all of the components of it and understand, you know, ancestrally why these were sought out, why these were more therapeutic. Yeah. I love that. I, you know, we, I've told this story that when we originally started our bone broth company and we, we really had a challenge finding bones, especially 12 years ago when we were looking for bones for, for Blake, they were nearly impossible to find. Then we started buying bones from Amish farmers. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would call ranchers once we started to scale. And I would call them. I remember the very first call that I had, it was the largest grass fed rancher in the country. And I said, Hey, I want to buy your bones. And he said, you want to buy my bones? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I don't even, we don't even process. Like we don't even know. He said, let me get back to you. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a price have point. To, <laughs> I don't, I we would have to find a processor that could make the bones and then try to ship them to you. So will you give me a little time to figure this out? And how serious are you? And I said, well, I'm pretty serious and I would buy them by the truckloads. And he said, oh, well, you're serious. <laughs> I said, yeah, we're pretty serious. And so he said, okay, let me get back to you and took a few, I want to say it was like six or eight weeks, maybe even three months. He got back to me and he said, okay, I found somebody that can process the bones. And I said, great, let's do this. And it was the same thing. He, they were throwing out their bones mm -hmm. and this beautiful, you know, ancient tradition of of, of that, you know, cultures all around the world have been used. We're really just being discarded. And it's a beautiful thing to be a part of, of that process and really kind of getting this back into, to people's diets. And I talk to people all the time, wherever we go, you know, travel all over the country. And I always have, you know, grandmothers that come up to me and, you know, whisper in my ear and say, you know, my children used to think I was crazy, but I always had bone broth on, mm -hmm. on the stovetop. And they always thought I would, I was crazy, but I would make them drink this like, you know, like it was penicillin. And I, you know, it's, it's just so fun to hear those stories. Definitely. And how about let's troubleshoot a little bit as far as what are two or three things that you see when people are making their own batches of bone broth that they might be doing wrong if, if the batch isn't turning out? So you mentioned, you know, like adding chicken feet because that's going to provide more of that gelatinous property that we all look for, the jiggle, right? Which we know that yeah. that's giving us more of the therapeutic gelatin and collagen within the delivery of glycine and glutamine and what have you. Uh, but when someone at home makes a batch that goes sour or something's wrong with it, what are like a couple tricks of the trade that you would suggest or things to watch out for? Yeah. So um, the first thing is, as I said, you want to start with clean source bones. Um, the second thing that's really important, Ellie, is, is this is um, very kind of interesting and something that we've really kind of had to talk to our um, people who consume our broth because sometimes they'll say, well, you know, the last bag was like jelly. I could barely put a knife through it. And this one is is gelatinous, but not like that one. And so every bone and every animal is different. Just like us, we have a different fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. And really every bone is going to yield a different kind of a broth and think about just think about like when you go to say the butcher and you buy let's just say a piece of filet mignon you go and you buy a filet mignon and you buy it from one butcher and he bought it from farmer a and you go wow this is a great piece of filet mignon look at all that marbling yum amazing i'm going to cook that for my family this week well then you go to another butcher and you buy it from farmer b 
and it's the same meat. It is a filet mignon, but it's less marbled. Well, that had everything to do with how that cow was raised, what time of year it was feeding on, you know, the, the, the grass. Was it in the spring? Yeah, season, the, for sure. Yeah, the season. And so I don't want you to be too hard on yourself when your bone broth doesn't gel as much as your last batch. It does not by any stretch of the imagine mean that you're not getting really all the benefits of that bone broth, particularly the amino acids. Because in my opinion, the amino acids is really where the key is for for bone broth. And so good source bones, what you want to do is you also want to add a little bit of apple cider vinegar. You don't need a lot of it. That will help chelate and pull all of those nutrients, minerals. You can use things like lemon juice and you don't need a lot, maybe about a tablespoon to say 10 quarts. The other thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you have the proper bone to ratio um, with water. And so what I like to say is like, if you put in, let's say 10 quarts, and I like to use a big giant 10 quart rather than a crock pot, because, um, you can make a lot of bone broth and store it in your freezer mm -hmm. rather than a, you know, a crock pot. I mean, my goodness, I would get through that in two days. And so then it becomes this, you know, laborious task that you don't want to do. But if you make your bone broth once every two weeks or once a month in a big 10 quart vat, and you put, um, you know, about a quart of bones on the bottom, add the rest of that with water, that's going to yield a really nice gelatinous broth. And then the simmer is really important. You almost want the lowest simmer where it doesn't even feel like it's simmering. Mm -hmm. um, you do need to kind of keep that on your stove overnight and you need to, you know, make sure that you're comfortable with that. Some people aren't and we, you know, we can't really kind of tell you to do that because if your burnt house burns down, we live in California, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. to this state, and then you're going to say, "Well, I was listening to Sharon on a podcast, and that's why my house burned down." So please, you know, check with I don't know your husband and your insurance policy. Find the waiver <laughs> <laughs> before you decide to do that. But that's what we did um, in our home, and that will typically yield you yield the best type of broth. Yeah, I just have the nostalgia. Like I'm, I'm so married to doing stovetop. I have a gas stove. Yet low simmer bone broth in the large, uh, you know, metal uh, stainless steel pots as well. I, I, I don't know. There's like I said, I think there's something just like nostalgic about it beyond the outcomes. But instant pot, and I don't know, Becky, maybe you can speak to your experience with instant pot. I, I've really only used my instant pot twice. I'm not a good instant pot advocate. Um, and I think that's a part because I just like the like traditional cooking methods. Um, but what I've seen is if I don't amply roast my bones, like especially using like beef knuckle, that those require a good pre-roast at like 400 or even higher uh, to get some of that mylar browning and, and not have a sour broth. I've had a sour broth if, if bones have been in a raw state. Have you experienced that, Sharon? Do you, do you pre-roast? We roast our beef bones, yes, mm -hmm. and for all of the reasons that you just said. Okay. And then the other thing I've seen just for listeners is I've also gone back and forth in my day of being super thrifty where I'll keep like a, you know, Ziploc freezer bag. So, you know, alliums are great sulfur add on, like you mentioned before, the garlic skins even, and you know, the onion skins and such. So I'll kind of put all that in a bag. But in the past when I've had, you know, big CSA farmer's market shares and I've been like, Oh, well, I'll try a stem of <laughs> a brassica, like stem nope. of kale here, <laughs> or, you know, maybe cabbage will do well. I've always, brassicas do not do well. You can make a cream of kale soup once you've made your bone broth, but don't be putting the sulfurous cruciferous brassicas into your bone broth because that will also make a, a tangy, sour flavor profile. I, I've really noted staying simple with like the mirepoix of like carrot, celery, onion, um, and then you can play with your base and, and then mix it up with flavors. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Like um, I found, I found with the Instapot, so we've done some different labs and the Instapot is great um, for, you know, quick kind of meals and that type of thing. Um, really the longer cooking times are needed for yeah. the abundance of the amino acids. It really is kind of this traditional slow cook method and think about the time. The time is actually what will allow you to pull all of those kind of medicinal uh, elements out of the broth. 
Yep, I totally agree. And and even flavor wise and just getting that gel with the instant pot, I've done it in a pinch where I at least want like a good quality broth to use as a base for a soup or a chili. It just never it never gels and it never turns out as well as stovetop. But in my household, I'm not allowed to do it on the stovetop <laughs> unless my husband's home because he's like Mr. Safety and he actually had a um, he owned a home or a condo when he was in college and had a tenant that burned it down. So he's like, really <laughs> yes, <laughs> all about, um, so we do ours in a crock pot unless we're going to be like mostly bopping around the house that day and like start it early in the morning. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the crock pot, the crock pot will do the job for you. Yes. Yes, I agree. Cook. And you know, you can buy the larger crock pots and then just use less bones. Cause I think what you'll find mm-hmm. is you're going to be surprised if you allow it to really cook for that long period of time, how gelatinous your broth will be. So just use less bones when you're using that crock pot and just know that you're going to have to do, do it more often than you're doing, you know, a 10, 12 quart um, cooking vessel. I love that. Um, so let's talk about storage of bone broth, both for like the home cook and also why um, your broth is is frozen. So I guess how long would you recommend storing in the fridge if you're making your own until you transition it to the freezer? And why did you make the decision to have bona fide provisions be a frozen product? Well, you know, um, I, it really was kind of this innate thing as I shared with you. I um, was a mom and I just wanted my, the bone broth that we eventually started to make, I just wanted it to be just like homemade. And when I was encouraged by retailers and some people who were interested in originally in investing in our company, and we didn't for this very reason, they, they said to us, let's put it in a box or in a, you know, a can. Um, and I said, but wait a minute, first of all, that's not what I'm doing at home. Like I'm not going to add, I'm not going to take my broth that I've just belabored over for 18 hours and now put it into a Tetra pack box that has aluminum in it and all of these other things that I really am not comfortable doing. Not only that, but then if I do put it in even a jar, I have to add citric acid to it. I wouldn't do that at home. So how do I do it at home? I just put it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we decided to do it that way. And the beauty is, is that what we found is that it maintains the efficacy of the product, right? So when we take our product and we do a lab, say now, and then we do a lab a year later, the product is the same exact product because freezing really is mother nature's preservative. You don't have to do anything funky to the product um, in order to freeze it. And so that's why we did it that way. It was really an intentional choice. Um, And then, you know, because I was working with so many sick people, I think I shared with you that I, I'm a GAPS practitioner and walked, you know, I was, I was, um, and I share this not, you know, to toot my horn. I share this because I want you to know my heart about nutrition and how many sick people that I've seen. I walked over 500 people through GAPS. I was um, in Natasha Campbell McBride's first ever graduating class of GAPS practitioners. And I walked so many sick people through GAPS that I knew that that this product had to be as pure as possible. So it was a little bit of a challenge for us initially because I had to make sure that the broth was cooled before it went into the packaging yeah, because I, I didn't want, yeah. I didn't want to make, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't any issues with any type of leaching because it's a, it's a plastic bag. And so, it, and, and really we had to put it in a plastic bag in order for it to, otherwise it would be $25 and then the people who needed it couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are working on um, hopefully optimizing that bag and we're working right now behind the scenes to do that. But initially when we launched, um, that was so important to me. And so we had to go through this process and create a machine that would cool the broth before just to the right temperature by the way, to, to be able to make sure that it still maintained all of the efficacy of the product. And then we'd have to put it into the, the bags. Um, that was a painstaking process to go through, um, but it was important to us. And that's why, that's why we did it. 
Love it. Let's talk before we go to our uh, mid roll sponsor. I want to hear for listeners that we didn't explain, I guess, what GAPS is. So gut and psychology syndrome. Uh, let's talk because I think there's a huge overlap in what you and I do, Sharon, my work with the anti-anxiety diet and this gut brain connection. Um, can you share with your experience how you maybe the mechanism of how bone broth can support gut lining and why that's important to brain health? Sure. And, you know, I want to say to you girls, thank you for what you're doing. You know, my life would have been so different if I had access to the information that you share um, 20 years ago. Um, Well, you know, I wouldn't be here today talking about bone broth. So (laughs) (laughs) then you weren't around back then, um, really. But, um, you know, kudos to you. So, so this is what we understand about bone broth now. So first of all, gut and psychology at syndrome, as you suggested, is um, an acronym for, um, for GAPS is an acronym for gut and psychology syndrome. It's a program that was created by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who is a neurosurgeon, a neurologist who is brilliant. Um, and her son was born with autism and she knew that there was a direct correlation between the gut and the brain. And um, she knew that if she was to Um, focus on just his brain, like the medical community was telling her that she was going to be missing a huge piece. And that was this, this beautiful symphony between the gut and brain. And so she decided that she was going to do something very different than what the medical community was telling her to do, which is just focus on his brain. And she focused on his gut and she decided she was going to heal his gut to see how that affected his brain. And her success story is that she did reverse all symptoms of autism. He has no signs of it, autism. Um, and so many people call it healed. Many people call it um, reversed all signs. It really just depends on where you, you want to um, believe that. And so she... Um, So then she opened up a clinic and she started working with autistic patients all over the world. And really the idea is that when we are in utero and we are being formed in our mother's womb, there is a piece of tissue that is being formed and that tissue breaks off and one becomes the gut and one becomes the brain and they are forever in communication via something called your enteric nervous system. They're like Siamese twins and whatever goes in your gut affects your brain and whatever goes into your brain affects your gut. And my favorite, I, um, Allie, you, 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 I, you, you girls may have already kind of used this example, but this is an example I used to give 10 years ago. And if you think about butterflies, the reason you have butterflies, many of you who have to go up and speak or talk or whatever it is, is because it's, it has everything to do with what you're thinking. You're just thinking about having to go up on stage and give a speech and it's causing your gut to react in a certain way where it's causing what we call these butterflies. And that's really a beautiful picture of how these two are very, very interrelated. So Dr. Natasha knew the healing benefits of broth and, and, um, and really she decided that that's was going to be the mainstay of her program. And, and so that's where, um, the bone broth comes in and it's particularly the amino acids in the bone broth. So the most important, in my opinion, amino acid in bone broth is L-glutamine. And I, if we can just nerd out a little bit and I'll try and keep this really simple, but, um, so we know that L-glutamine, glutamine is a, an amino acid, um, but what's very interesting is that it is the preferred fuel source for the cells that line your gut. So you have your lining of your gut, your, muc- your mucosal lining of your gut, and all around that gut is a bunch of cells. And think about those cells just sitting there like these little Pac-Man waiting for food to come, you know, like this catcher's mitt. And they're like, come on, hand it to me. And the first thing that they encounter is L-glutamine. They love it so much that what they do is their response is they start spitting out um, something that's very similar to like a little bit of mucus. And that mucus can actually act like a like spackle or like a little sewing needle that will go and tear, or I'm um, sorry, sew up the little tears in the mucosal lining of the gut. And so we know scientifically now that this is the benefits, one of the main benefits of um, bone broth is the glutamine that's in that bone broth, particularly in the gut region. And so that's really kind of Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride's um, 
uh, kind of reasoning behind the bone broth and why it's such a big mainstay of her program. And not only has she used the GAPS program to teach treat people with autism, but anybody on the spectrum, but also ADD, ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, um, anxiety, um, things like depression. Absolutely. And, and it's just like my approach of food as medicine being a double-edged sword, both the abundance and the focus of bone broth and the therapeutic foods that repair gut, as well as the removal of you know those long chain carbohydrates and the fermented foods based on microbiome mm-hmm. imbalances and Definitely uh, her work played a a foundation in my functional medicine training as well. So it's a really cool connection. And just before we go to break, I just want to nerd out a little bit further too. Um, So totally, that's, that was kind of my verbatim. And I always tell people, L-glutamine is both a fuel source and a building block for your enterocytes. Like that's the coolest thing ever (laughs) Uh, to see that it can both, you know, actually feed them, but also build uh, the tissue. So it's a, a pretty remarkable impact. And connecting a little bit further, like you mentioned, the enteric nervous system and central nervous system, they have this bilateral communication. And we see that the enteric nervous system or the gut actually has more neurons than the brain and the spinal cord combined. And we see that social anxiety, chronic stress, and really the impact of perceived threat, so that's usually anxiety or stress response in the central nervous system. Actually, we see clinically markers like secretory IgA and lipopolysaccharide, LPS. We actually see that leaky gut is driven from stress alone. And so there's definitely a chicken and egg relationship of if we are therapeutically proactive, when I'm on book tour, when I'm speaking, I'm always a higher intake of bone broth and even I'll layer in my GI lining support because these are times that the gut is susceptible to more damage. And so you want to work to really be proactive in the repair process. And then as you were saying, you know, when we're talking about inflammatory bowel, that's the only thing. That, that's when my gastroenterologists are my number one you know, turnkey referrals because they'll say, I've never seen a colonoscopy look this good. What are you doing? <laughs> what is this person doing? Um, and it's, it's therapeutic diet and these compounds, very powerful. It is. Thank you for adding all of that. Um, <laughs> thank you for adding all of that. And I, um, I have a little story. I, we may need to go to break, but I do have a little story of um, a, a mom who came to me um, and was told that she had to have part of her colon removed. She was only 40 years old um, and a really fun kind of success story, really kind of to your point of what we were just talking about. Awesome. Oh, that's so wild. Um, Wow. So let's go into today's uh, sponsor, F-Bomb. They are a fantastic company that Becky and I both love. They started as a nut butter line and they make great snacks for kids, premium oils, high quality fats that you can add on to any meal, including MCT oils, olive oils, and then their nut butter blends are macadamia or coconut based and very simple whole food ingredients. Yes, we absolutely love their super convenient nut butter packs for on-the-go travel. There's always one if you play the what's in my purse game. There's always, always one or more in there at any given time. And I absolutely love their premium oil packs as well when I'm traveling, especially if I'm going somewhere where I'm not so sure about the quality of oils being used in a restaurant. I can bust out their avocado oil or MCT oil packs to use on a salad. And I love that they've expanded their line even further with their new pork sticks and their Keto Crunch Cheese Krispies that are a delicious snack. Yes, the Cheese Crisps use microbial enzymes to form versus additives like cellulose and such and have a really fantastic mouthfeel. As do the pork sticks, dare I say that they are one of the more fat dominant meat sticks on the market and the dare I say word is moist. They have a really good <laughs> mouthfeel. Uh, definitely don't take uh, you know like a dried out jerky as a comparison. So go on over to dropanfbomb.com backslash Allie Miller RD to check out all of my favorite products, which include all of those things noted. And be mindful, just as important as it is to get a foundation of healthy gut, 
also is to be fat fueled. And so one of the best ways that you can mellow out a toddler, and I know it with my three and a half year old, is to give them more fat. Fat is so fantastic for uh, rebounding our hormones in our body at any age, as well as supporting our neurological function and really grounding our energy levels. We all know that we live in a world that is dominant in carbohydrate rich snack foods and creating these roller coasters of blood sugar irregularity. So, dropping an F bomb is one way to stay grounded and nourished and also tame your toddlers, tantrums, or any child's mood disturbances. <laughs> so go on over to dropanfbomb.com slash Allie Miller RD, and uh, you also save 10% on your first order. Awesome. So speaking of products that we love, both Bonafide Provisions and F-Bomb were along for the ride on the Anti-Anxiety Diet book tour, and people have been loving all of the things that we had to offer with our um, sponsor samples. But Sharon, do you want to go ahead and, and um, jive a little bit on that story of, of the success story that you mentioned and, and tell us what the outcome was with that client? Sure. And I love F-bomb. And I, um, I have to tell you that last night I, I was on a flight home from a nutrition conference and the gentleman next to me was eating the meal that was supplied um, on the flight and I was having my apple with nut butter um, on the way home as <laughs> my mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, anyways my mouth is watering after all of the things that you just said um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, and you know, when I was practicing, I worked with just as, as you do m many of the gastroenterologists. And um, I had a gal that came to me, 40 years old. Um, we're in San Diego. She come. She came from Orange County. The cutest mom, 40 years old. Her husband was a police officer, and she was developed Crohn's disease. Um, it came on very quickly. Within six months, she was full blown. Crohn's disease. The doctors at UC Irvine told her that she had to have part of her colon removed. And she came to me as a last ditch effort. And so we put her on um, the, the GAPS protocol is, is what I did with her. And, um, and she was a tough case to crack and but she was in it right and she was uh she was compliant and she decided that she really this was going to save her life and um after a year of being 100 percent compliant and reversing all of her symptoms she went back got a colonoscopy the doctor told her i don't know what you've been doing um you know kind of denied that it had anything to do with nutrition but he said you have a colon of a teenager <laughs> So, so we do understand the effects. And I, you know, I always used to tell people when we were dealing with colon issues, I would say the colon is just on the receiving end, like a catcher's mitt on what's going on up above. You know, it's just downstream from your gut. You have to focus on the gut. So I, I loved that you had mentioned all of, all of that wonderful information. I love that. And oftentimes with our IBD clients, we'll do like a, a three or five day bone broth fast with them actually, where we do provide, you know, high doses of, of um, either your bone broth or their own if they're wanting to make it. Um, and it's something I've incorporated into my own life as well as kind of a, a reset, you know, just a little bit of a, a detox gut rest, like after a high stress weekend or a lot of travel and inflammatory foods. And I find it something that works really, really well in that population. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that we, we would all three agree. And I've, I know that I've heard this from, from you and um, I, you know, it's not the magic bullet, right? There is no magic pill. Bone broth isn't the magic pill. It's not the magic bullet. And I always like to remind people of that. It's, it's part of the puzzle right. and it's a piece of the, the, the wellness protocol. Um, and the, you know, there are many other things that, that you'll have to do working, um, alongside, you know, the two of you is really important. I, I get so many people that reach out and they say, Hey, I'm trying to do all of this on my own and I'm, I'm lost. Can you help me? And I, you know, of course I can't, um, cause they're not a, client of mine, you know, I, I, I can't do that. But I always say, work with a practitioner. I mean, you can try and figure this out and add a little bit of this in and take a probiotic or whatever it is for the next two years. But when you work with somebody, they are going to oftentimes be able to fast track you to health um, because they're going to really take this bio-individual approach yes. to you and what is needed. Yeah. 
Let's talk, Sharon, a little bit before we transition into entrepreneur stuff about uh, for those that don't tolerate bone broth well, um, what have you seen in your clinical experience for why this might be? And do you have an approach as far as like a starting point to allow them to reap some of the benefits and, and kind of work their way up? Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to share with you, I think this is can be a little bit quite controversial right now, particularly where we are with a lot of the Instagram accounts and um, this notion of, you know, food being bad for you, food being good for you. And so I, I, there is, I there's I, so much polarity right mm -hmm. now. <laughs> wow. You know, it's gosh, <laughs> life is 10 years ago when I was doing this, but um, so, you know, I, I, I can only share what I know from a clinical experience. It's not my opinion, right? It's not me saying, hey, this is what I read to be true. Um, I can only share with what I've found to be true with working with thousands of people across the country and a four-month wait list. And that is that there are some programs that just work. And the GAPS program just really worked for my clients. Now, I did a very modified version of GAPS for most people unless I was working with autistic children because totally different. Autistic children have such a heavy, heavy um, toxic load that you have to do things much more slowly with them. But in general, um, I, you know, I, I did a modified version. And so some of the things that you have to be careful with, say bone broth, is people who may be sensitive to histamines or glutamates, but I, and I, I say this very cautionary, that was very rare in my practice because I would put them on gaps. We would start with the, the longer cooking time bone broth, and we would go through the first few stages of, of gaps within a couple of weeks, and we were able to get rid of those sensitivities. Now, again, that is my own experience in my own practice and I can't tell people to go do that or another practitioner that that could work for them. Um, so if you are not working with somebody and you don't believe what I'm saying, then what I would suggest is that you use a lower cooking time broth to start out with if you have histamines and glutamate issues and then eventually gradually move to a longer cooking time. So what you'll want to do is you'll want to make a stock You'll want to add bones and a little bit of meat to that product, and you only want to cook it for about two to three hours, and that will make sure that it doesn't have those higher glutamates, which cause that kind of histamine response, um, and then you can move towards a longer cooking broth. That's not something that I did in my own practice except for two individuals, and both of those individuals were autistic. Um, one was 16 and one was four years old. Yeah, and is that is that Natasha McBride that does that, or Sally Fallon? I because I remember that distinguishment too of of uh, and I'm happy you addressed it. It's exactly what I wanted to have listeners hear is right: chicken stock versus bone broth. Um, yep. this is one of them, right? I forget. Yeah. So so the Gaps program typically will have you start off with stock, which okay. is a lower cooking time. So we'll just distinguish the difference between stock and broth. Stock is cooked with a little bit of meat and the bones less than three hours broth is bones only right so no meat mm -hmm. and longer cooking times up you know usually typically 18 to, to 48 hours so um gaps always start to i did not but gaps always typically she'll start out with a stock the three hour cooking time and then move you to um the longer cooking bone broth yeah, I, I agree, Sharon. I haven't seen much intolerance, exception of like mast cell disorder or someone that has known histamine intolerance. And usually that root cause comes back to disruption within the microbiome. So, you know, you can kind of work two entry points within the therapeutic protocol. And the idea is over time, they should be able to tolerate. And then the other thing I would just note to listeners that I've seen is, if the individual has an immunological inflammatory response to maybe that particular compound, like for instance, very rare actually do I see people that have, we use the MRT test as far as our inflammatory food panel, and very rare do we see like an extreme reaction to let's say beef or chicken. 
But in that individual, I will hold that sourced bone broth and, and use a different animal product as the base matter for at least three months, maybe upwards of six months. And then we kind of reintroduce and retest with that other protein source. Sure. And it could even be the onions or the garlic that you're added. So maybe even doing a, a bone broth or a stock that's just simple bones, water, and apple cider vinegar and salt to start with that individual too. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. I think we've nerded out sufficiently on bone broth. <laughs> I just want to talk a, a little bit, uh, you know, advice for budding entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I, I'm interested to hear your your role. It, it's really cool. I work with my husband as well. And I know when you guys were coming on to sponsor my Food is Medicine at the Farm event, I actually had a conversation with your husband before you, Sharon, which is pretty funny, you know. And I, I mean, I don't think he was necessarily vetting me, but it was pretty cool. I was like, okay, that's really awesome seeing Reb really stepping up and, and making sure he understands, you know, what this event is all about and ensuring the integrity of the fit. How have you felt that, let's talk like synergy of working with your partner, but also, you know, you still being kind of like the lead as far as I perceive it. I don't know if that's correct, um, but being a female entrepreneur in this space, you know, how that's kind of impacted you or, or do you feel you put them up to bat to, to help to balance that or how that all works? Yeah, well, um, I would not suggest working with your husband for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are many challenges that it is presented, but you know, I, I did some interview. I don't, I don't recall. It was, I think it was for BevNet and it was great. They were kind of interviewing different brands and they wanted to focus on Reb and I, and you know, Reb and I have been together for 30 years. We met working together and we're just better together. And what I have found is that he allows me to shine where I am able to and vice versa. Um, and Reb, he, I, I, don't, I don't think either of us really like being in the spotlight, but he hates being in the spotlight. And so he will go run and duck from a camera <laughs> where, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of be forced into the front and then just kind of, you know, put on a smile and there we go. Um, so, you know, after 30 years of working together, it, it just works. And, you know, I did, I am kind of the, the, the person that has led the charge with this brand and he's allowed me to do that. And it's really just been a beautiful relationship. I mean, there's times when we owned a restaurant and he was the chef and, you know, it, people would say, Oh, you're Reb's wife. And I would say, yes, I am. And, you know, and now he will go places and they go, Oh, you're Sharon's husband. And he goes, yes, I am. Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, really, I think net net at the end of the day, um, Reb and I are each other's biggest fans and we feel that we have a calling, you know, we, we, everything in our life has happened for a reason and our son became sick for a reason. And I, you know, we, he became passionate about this whole journey when I became passionate about it. So yes, I am. It is, you know, female founded. He's kind of in the background and he's the one that just goes, says, go girl, do it. You know, whatever you need from me, I'm here. I can build it. I can make it. Um, and, and I'm here for you. And so that's really exciting. As far as being a female entrepreneur, I think I'm at the right time at the right place because I think you know, we're in a culture that's very sensitive to that and we're just not going to take um, people's BS anymore. And so I have not found um, in the last few years that it's been a negative thing. I think it's a positive thing. In fact, investors and, you know, and retailers and they, they want female founded companies. They want us to have a voice out there because we can bring so much right to the picture. And I think that there's um, just this innate sense that moms have. Um, and I think once something, pat, you know, in kind of fuels the passion and it has to do with our children, we become like these crazy women that won't stop. Um, and then everybody just has to move out of the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, right. And so, um, so that's a good thing. So I remember I was, I was recently with a bunch of women CEOs and a lot of them have been at this far longer than I have 20 years. So they have experienced a lot different um, scenarios than I have, but I can thankfully say that in this food space, which I love being a part of this food space, um, that 
we, I have been welcome. I have been heard. I have been valued. Um, and you know, even when I was being told to create a shelf stable broth because I can make, um, double the amount of money. Um, I had investors that heard me and listened to me and valued what I have to say based on my experience as a mom. So um, I think it's I think it's been a, a pretty good journey so far. I love that, and I think the integrity piece and the passion piece are very very clear and evident. Not only in your product, but also we've loved working with, and I've said this over and over to Allie during the book tour. Your team made things so easy for us. They're amazing. Grace and Miles are freaking awesome. Um, they sent us the percolator, which what have we named it, Allie? It's got Irma. a name now, Irma. Uh, like the <laughs> like the hurricane. Ooh, <laughs> what? Like the wasn't it Hurricane Irma? Well, you know, there's a hurricane yeah. named after everything. You're right. You're right. You're right. It's Irma's <laughs> beloved term. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but they sent us the percolator. They made us those customized stickers. They gave us the vouchers and made everything so easy. And even, you know, working with them at um, food as medicine at the farm, I was out there like telling your team, really okay, okay. Yeah. yep. Yeah. Like chop these onions for me and do this and do that. And they're like, okay, lady, like, I don't even know who you are, but they did such a bang up job and it was, it was totally flawless. So wow. high compliments there. Um, I'd love to hear um, just like a, a couple of words of advice for the budding entrepreneur or, or someone who's looking to either bring their product or their business or their idea into this space. Yeah, I think the first thing is, um, you know, kind of parlays off of what you just spoke about. Surround yourself with people who believe in your product, believe in you and have a passion um, for, for what you are doing as a brand, um, whatever, whatever that brand is. Um, I, you know what, I, 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 there is no balance when <laughs> you are creating a product or an, a brand, or, um, you are an entrepreneur and I, you know, I've been an entrepreneur now for 30 years. And, um, I remember early on, probably the first 15 years I was young and there was this whole idea of like trying to find balance and, you know, do you get nannies? Do you not get nannies? Do you stay home? Do you not stay home? You got to find balance. You, you know, your kids are going to be totally screwed up if you don't. And what I found was that I was so focused on finding balance that it was making me, you know, just exhausted. And, um, and I wasn't able to achieve that goal. And when I realized that, you know what, there isn't going to be balance, but I'm going to give as much energy as I can to each one of these things. Um, and that's going to be fine is when I really was able to, um, have great success in whatever I was doing. There were times in my, my nutrition practice that on Friday nights, I would drive home and I would literally cry because I just couldn't take one more, you know, illness, um, issue, patient, whatever it was, um, and then have to come home to, you know, teenagers. Right. Um, and so I just had to learn to like, turn my teenagers off for a little while and say, you're not going to get the best of me right now. So we're going to wait until tomorrow on Saturday. And that's when you're going to get the best of me. And so it really, it, it's, it's not going to be the perfect balance and you are going to work seven days a week. Um, and you, and that's going to be okay. Um, and there are going to be, and so when you find that, that you're, you're going to be okay with that, what you get to do, and then as you become more successful, you get to take really great vacations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then you get the rest that you need and then you come back motivated and ready to go. And then once you're able to scale, then there's a little bit more balance in all of it. So that's really kind of the best advice that I can give early on in those early years. Um, be okay with not finding the balance. I love it. And right. If, and if you're not, then it's probably not the right product, right passion, mm -hmm. right thing. Right. Because I, I can't agree with that more. I, I was rolling my eyes. I was at this women's entrepreneur thing and this <laughs> woman raised her hand. Oh, we got to wrap, but it's just too funny in the context. And she goes, <laughs> I've been looking for my passion. Um, <laughs> I've been working three, I've been working jobs for like the last two to three years. So I just decided to like stop working so I can find my passion. <laughs> 
how do you suggest I do that? And I called Becky after and I was like, these effing millennials. <laughs> I was working three jobs when I knew my passion yeah. had to happen to make the money to create a practice and a brand. <laughs> you know, so it's like if you don't have the hustle in your step, you got to just not do it. That's my answer too. Yeah. There you I go. Agree. Your passion is going to be fueled at 3 a.m. when you can't sleep. Yep. And you have to go right to the whole world about something that you have yeah. on your mind. <laughs> you have to do it. That's when you do it. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yes, absolutely. Awesome. Yep. So let's talk real quick. I just want to tell everyone, of course, you can be found at bonafideprovisions.com. And when people go there, you can use the code always Allie Miller RD with savings on your online order, which is a great way. We love to keep Becky and I, although we make bone broth religiously, I am not found to have a freezer without bona fide provisions in it because there's always times when I need to supplement a dish, to deglaze a pan, to sip on a mug on a stressful day. And I love having it available as a resource. So where let's give a little info for people that maybe haven't explored your product. I'd love just real quick to touch on the keto cups, which are fantastic. Oh, and yeah. Something else exciting coming down the pipeline for 2020. Sure. So you can find our products in the frozen aisle and all you need to do is go on our website, put in your zip code and you'll be able to find a store near you. Um, even Walmart carries our bone broth now, which is so exciting. The so Walmart cool very forward thinking right now. And they have an amazing freezer set with such great foods. Um, and then as far as our keto cup goes, you know, our keto cup had zero to do with the keto trend and everything to do with the fact that that's how my husband drinks his bone broth every morning. And when I was practicing most of my patients, I would go into a for a state of ketosis originally, initially with them. And you really oftentimes in the gaps, the first week of gaps, you do go into a state of ketosis. And I just found that it's a really great place for the body to be when you're trying to heal. And so um, I came home from uh, an, an offsite when, when, a week. And I called uh, Amanda, who is now our CEO of our company, by the way, I've moved out of our role as a CEO and moved into the role of president. Um, and she, I called Amanda and I called my husband, Reb, and I said, I think we need to put the way that Reb drinks his broth into a cup because it's so convenient. It's, you know, it's our bone broth with either MCT oil, grass fed butter, coconut oil, a little bit of curcumin, and um, people are going crazy over this stuff because we were kind of sampling it everywhere. And so that's what we did. And really all of our products is stuff that we consume in our own lives and in my own practice. We have a line of soups. Um, there's six different flavors, all with a bone broth base. My idea was, hey, people didn't stop eating soup. They stopped eating the soup that's in the supermarket because it's so bad for you. And so it's all organic ingredients. Um, and we have a few things coming down the pike that are very exciting that we're probably going to be launching next year, but we're just in the initial stages. Um, and I can't wait to kind of share those with you all soon. Awesome. Well, I love all of those things because here in Texas, I get the feedback often of, I don't want to drink hot meat juice <laughs> when it's a hundred <laughs> plus degrees. So I love that Bonafide Provisions has the soups available. That's a really great entry point and still gives you that therapeutic property as well as the keto cups. And uh, we've done uh, on my book tour, we'll take that percolator and um, we'll put in uh, a ratio of the frontier blend and chicken bone broth. So a little blend, or sometimes we'll do beef and chicken depending on our stock and what we can get. And then um, canned full fat coconut milk, turmeric. Uh, we put in uh, pinches of uh, salt to boost that a little bit. And then um, limes, we'll juice like about two limes per bag or uh, a lime and a half per bag. And then um, that all sits in that percolator and then we have cilantro out to top and people are loving that little blend too. Mm -hmm. So it's so such a vehicle for doing so much fun stuff with flavor. And in the anti-anxiety diet cookbook, I have a table beyond the recipes that use bone broth called bone broth five ways to do these really quick kind of whip up. We have a bone broth, bloody Mary, <laughs> all oh, sorts yeah. of fun things. So you get the therapeutic, but you also can mix up your flavor profiles. So good. And you know, when it, when it is hot, we, what I used to do with Blake, because I had to slip it into everything that I made, um, I would just pour my bone broth into um, ice cube trays, freeze it, and then pop it into smoothies. Um, he sure. had no idea that the bone broth was in there and we would kind of put it into everything. So great um, ideas. And now my mouth is watering. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my gosh. And speaking of, um, make our mouths water a little bit more. Tell us what you ate since we're both dietitians and you have clearly a, a very robust nutrition background as well, Sharon. Um, give us your 24 hour recall. So this is our last question that we ask all of our podcast guests. I want to know what you ate yesterday, which was Monday. No, nope, yesterday Sunday. was Sunday. <laughs> Today is Monday. Um, I know it was a travel day for you. So what you ate from the time that you woke up to the time that you went to bed. Yeah. So yesterday I just happened to be at the Weston A. Price Foundation conference. So they provide the food. Um, so I woke up in the morning. I had a yerba mate tea. Um, I typically drink uh, yerba mates, although I make it at home for myself when I'm home. So I had a yerba mate tea. And then I, I really did fast the entire morning because I, um, there wasn't a good breakfast available um, because I didn't make it over to the conference in time. And so at lunch, um, I had um, what they were serving, which is um, they had some fermented uh, vegetables. Um, they also had um, a, a great little uh, b a pad of butter on the side. You know, they have butter for um, everything that you yes. consume there. Like um, the largest but, bowls of butter you've ever seen. <laughs> it, was, it was a butter feast in, in you know, the Weston A. Price uh, uh, foundation. Um, we, we had a little bit of liver pate, um, which was quite delicious. And that was really, I had loads of all of that. Um, and then I didn't eat again until I hopped on the plane. And that's when I ate, um, apple and nut butter. Um, it's not a lot of food that I consumed yesterday, but sometimes when I travel, I find that it's just better for me to eat less than it is to just eat anything. Um, but I had a, you know, honey crisp ass, a, apple with um, two packages of, of nut butter on it. Sounds fantastic and like a good navigation. Yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sharon, for taking the time to speak with us today. I'm sure that you've inspired many for all of the ways that they can use bone broth to heal their body. And um, we look forward for future collaboration in the new year and just can't thank you enough for putting out the resource and quality food product that we use in clinic with so many of our, our patients. Thank you both. And thank you for what you are doing. I am so proud of you as a mom um, and a nutritionist and wow, what a resource you are. And so um, congratulations. And I will continue to send good vibes and good thoughts your way. And we'd love to be able to support you in any way um, for all that you're doing. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well. <laughs>